Amen. May God be glorified in this place this morning. Please uh, remain standing today for the reading of God's Word. Before I read, though, could you greet a couple people this morning and just bless them? May you all be blessed this morning for being here and for studying God's Word. May God's Word bless you today. Amen. Let me begin this morning by reading verses 7 through 9 in Genesis chapter 2 just to get us started. God's Word says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted the garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would you join me in prayer this morning father as we gather to worship you today as we gather to praise you and to study you Lord be we seek you to be in our midst. Lord, we seek you to speak to us. Jesus, we ask that today as we dive into the riches of your truth, that we would set aside our own agendas, our own plans, and we would surrender to you so that you would reveal to us what you desire for each and every one of us. God, I pray for every soul here. I pray for everyone who is listening. Lord, that you would do mighty things in their lives today if there is power it's in found in your word in your spirit so we pray that your word would come alive within us we pray that each and every one of us would surrender in such a way that you would allow us to be moved in you to be transformed by your truth Lord this is your time speak to each and every one of us in your precious name we pray Jesus amen Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How is everybody this morning? Good. Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you open up to the book of Genesis chapter 2 this morning? We're going to start with verse 4 and hopefully finish the chapter. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there is some in the back. Just make sure our ushers see you, so keep your hands up so that it can bring you one. And if you're using your digital devices, you know what to do. Okay, make sure you silence them. Hey, we got quite a bit to cover today, and not a lot of time. And here's the thing, I, I do feel, like I told you this a couple of weeks ago, I do feel I will disappoint a bunch of you, because when we come to chapter 2 of Genesis, everybody has their own ideologies about how the sermon should be preached. And I tell you, I could focus on a hundred different directions. I could focus on marriage. I could focus on the role of a man or a role of a woman. I could focus on, I don't know, you name it. Anything that you want, we could find from here. But So I have been praying to the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want this congregation to know? And this is where we are today. We're going to talk about purpose today. What was mankind really made for in a general perspective of what mankind was made for? And I got to tell you this, I don't know about you, but when I look back in my life, I see that I spent the first decade or so of my life looking for purpose. And I searched in everything and everywhere, especially coming from an Islamic background, I looked for every way to know what I'm supposed to do or what I am made for to a point that at some point in my life I gave up and I realized or thought to myself that I was made for nothing and I was useless. And it wasn't until I found Christ that I really discovered that I was made for something greater than, than I can even anticipate or understand. My purpose is to give glory to the God of all creation because I was made in His image. Now, we talked about that last week. And I think, though, even today, the young people are still struggling. And there are people who are still a few centuries old. And you're still struggling about the, your purpose. And you're trying to figure out, what am I made for? What is my purpose in life? And I tell you, God's Word is very clear on some of this. So we're going to look at the general perspective on that. But it really begins with you being able to ask yourself, even if God were to reveal to you what your purpose is, you have to ask yourself this question, do I embrace and live up to what God has made me to do? Do I embrace it and do I live up to what God has made me to do? Because otherwise, what's the point of it? 
Do you really embrace it? Now, my prayer today, and I've been praying for this all week, I, my prayer is that God would deliver people today. My prayer is that God would deliver you from brokenness. My prayer is that God would deliver you from confusion, that God would deliver you from sorrow, from pain, and all sort of different things are the weapons of the enemy that he wants to take you captive through so that you would not live up to that purpose for which you were created. And I want to jump right into God's Word today. We've got quite a bit to cover, as I said this morning. But let me ask you this. Is there anybody excited about God's Word this morning? Yeah. Awesome. If you're excited, I want to start with verse 4. Let me give you an overview before we go to verse 4, though. An overview. Last week, we looked at the fact that God made man in His own image. And we looked at chapter 1 and chapter 2, beginning of chapter 2. We looked at the first seven days of creation in the past two days. And then in verse 4 of Genesis chapter 2, it says this. It says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, and when they were created. In the day, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And let me pause here for a few moments. It says these are the generations. And, and every time you see these words, and there's a lot of confusion, I have to tell you, there's a lot of confusion. As soon as people transfer from chapter 1 of Genesis, chapter 2 of Genesis, there's a little bit of a confusion going on, especially in the realm of theology or in the theological studies, because there are certain people who see some inconsistencies in the chapter, first chapter of Genesis, and as soon as you enter chapter 2 of Genesis, because it looks like to some people that there are two different creation stories. However, I have to tell you this, there is no inconsistencies whatsoever. If I were to put this into perspective, this is not something I have in your notes, but I'm just telling you this, okay? There are two things that you got to gather from this. As you look at chapter 1 of Genesis, you have a panoramic view of creation, okay? You have the first six days, and you look at that, and you have how God created all things. When you enter chapter 2, the focus changes is is no longer a panoramic view but it is a focused view of creation focused on God's prized position the creation of humanity because after all the book of Genesis wasn't written or the whole book of the Bible was not written to tell us about the universe it was not written to tell us about the plants or vegetation or the animals. It was written to tell us about how much God cares for His creation in humanity and that we are the ones who are created in the image of God. So every time you see the words generation in the book of Genesis, you know that there's a literally segmentation taking place. The author is separating the writing, so you know the focus is changing for a few mo moments or for however long. You guys still with me? So verse 4. Now, I want to read verses 5 through 7. Now, let me tell you this. I am not going to focus on everything here, only purpose, okay? There is so much to cover here. But verse, verse 5, it says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. Now, hold on to that, because we will get to that when we get to Noah, okay? So don't get distracted on that yet. And there was no man to work the ground, so when the plants, and, and they had nobody to take care of the land, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground, when the Lord God formed the man, then the Lord God formed the man, this is important, of what? Dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So when there was no plants being taken care of, okay, when, when there was no rain yet in the sense that we understand it, which we'll get to that later, God took dust and formed man with his own hands, with his own words, however he did it, he formed you out of the dust of the earth. Now, I realize that there is a lot of people even today who say, you know what, I don't like the idea that man is made out of the dust of the earth. That means we are kind of worthless. And people don't like that, and I understand it, but did you know the greatest quality of dust? I'll tell you that in a moment, but let me give you, I, want, I have three lessons, I have three lessons for us today. Lesson number two in particular, I want to personalize it. But I have three lessons. If you're note takers, feel free to write them down. If, if um, you would rather have the copies of the notes in the back or underneath later on the sermon, I'll have them available for you. But lesson number one, if you're note takers, God created us to be dependent on His power. Amen. And sometimes we forget that. Now, I told you, do you know the greatest quality of dust? Dust is always dependent on an external power to move it. 
It's always dependent. In other words, dust depends on the wind to move its particles from one place to another. Dust depends on waters to move it from one location to another, or it gets trampled underfoot by people or animals as it gets stuck underneath them to go from one place to another. And just like dust, you and I are dependent on the external power of God to move us from one place to another. Now, I know some of you are looking at me saying, hold on a second. No, 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 you don't realize. I got a big bank account, and I have this beautiful house. I have this beautiful car. I have, achieved, I have degrees. I have achieved all these wonderful things. No, listen, you you don't understand. Everything that you have, God breathed and He moved you to where you were supposed to go to. Everything you possess, everything you own, God moved you to that place. His living water perhaps carried you to where you're supposed to be right now in this church so that you could be reminded that, hey, you are dust. <laughs> and what is amazing is that when a potter, which the scripture calls God a potter, when a potter gets the dust and adds water to it and makes mud, and he molds the pot into whatever he desires it to look like, he makes a vessel based on what he desires the pot to look like. So that means that when God forms us out of the dust of the earth as the greatest potter, he made us as vessels to be used for a particular purpose. But when we are not being used for that purpose, then our purpose is being dismissed. And that's where we find ourselves in a lot of chaos and confusion. But God created you out of the dust of the earth. He created you for a purpose. And through these words, he reminds you that if you are dust, then you are dependent on the external power of God to move you, to do with you what he desires for you to do. In other words, apart from God, you can do nothing. And Jesus says the same words in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine. He says it in a different way, with different illustration. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you find your purpose. Because if you begin to put your trust in God, God, I am your vessel, use me. The sooner you realize that he can do amazing things through you. You still with me? Yeah. Now, I'm going to read quite a few verses here, but again, remember, our focus at the moment is our purpose, okay? So I know there's a lot more we can gain from this. Verse 8 says, and the Lord God, help me out with this word, it's important, planted, planted a what? Garden. And the Lord God planted the garden, and the Lord God planted the garden in Eden in the east, and there he, he did what? He put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. I love this. Keep the verse on the screen for a moment. I love it because everything he put in that garden was pleasant to the eye. It was like, man, this is delicious stuff. And then the, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we're going to get to this next week, okay, the two trees. Today, we briefly will talk about them, but not as to how the sequence of events take place. So you need to still hold on to that. That's why it's important for you to kind of be with us in the series, because we are covering a little bit at a time. But look at this, verse 10, a river flowed out of, the, out, of the, out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became, to, became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now keep that on the screen for a second. You may look at it and say, why do I need all these details? It is given to you so that you would know this is not a made-up story. That these are real locations, real rivers, that everything that God did has a purpose. But I'm going to bring you to verse 15 for a second, and then we're going to come back to this. Is the, the Lord God took the man and did what? Put him in what? In the garden that he created. Listen, God created this garden, put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in it, put every tree that was desirable. There's rivers flowing. It's a beautiful paradise. It's amazing. And God it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it, work it and keep it. keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now we're going to come back to that next week, okay? So hold on to it. But go back to verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and did what? He put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So God created man then for a purpose of doing something, not just sitting and looking like a pot, a dust that was formed, but for a purpose. Now you are dust, so God created you in his own image. Out of the dust of the ground, he molded you into the shape that you were supposed to be. And then he created a garden just for mankind, and he put man into that garden to take care of it and to keep it. Now I want you to write down lesson number two, okay? Lesson number two, God created us for diligence and zeal, not for laziness. God created you for the purpose of being diligent and doing amazing things in your life. Now, for the next few moments, you may look at me right now and say, you know what, Uh, all this I see, God created Adam, he put him in a garden, and there's rivers in there, the gold is good in there, bdellium and onyx are in there, I mean, this amazing place, so what? What am I supposed to do with it? I don't have it. I can't even get close to that gold or the rivers. What do I do with this? For the next few moments, I want to personalize this as much as you can. Now, here's the thing. I can tell you everything I tell you, but at the end of the day, it is you who has to personalize this. So I want to encourage you. I want to give you four things, four reminders today. I will give it to you in a moment. But four reminders that I encourage you every day to tell yourself. Every day, remind yourself of this because this story still applies to you and to me. And it is powerful when you turn it and personalize it in such a way that you realize it matters. And I want to tell you this. What what I'm about to tell you, some of you may look at me and say, this guy is out of his gourd. You may say to me, you may look at me and say, why did you eat for breakfast? Because what you say, I I just don't understand it. Just stay with me for a moment. Are you with me? Can I? You know what? If you stay awake five minutes, then you can fall asleep. That's fine. Okay? But this is so significant because we're going to personalize this. And make it mean something for for us. What if I told you that in the same way that God created Adam and placed them in the Garden of Eden, He planted a garden just for Eden. God has planted a specific garden for each and every one of you. And in that particular garden, He has put the tree of life and He has put the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for each and every single one of you. And it's something that you have to remind yourself of every day. Let me personalize this in this. I want to give you four reminders. Reminder number one, if you're note takers, I want you to remind yourself, where I am in life right now might very well be the garden that God has planted for me to cultivate. Where you are right now in your life may very well be the garden that God has planted just for you to cultivate it. And I know it's crazy for us to look at it that way, but God has placed you, listen, This is February 4th of 2024. Out of all the places in the universe, you are here right now. You could have been born a thousand years ago. You could have been born a thousand years from now, but in His sovereignty, the God of all creation saw fit that it is necessary that you would be born in this timeline, and today you would be in this building, not only worshiping the Creator of the heavens and the earth, but also hear the words that God has planted a garden for you to cultivate. So that you would know that you are created for a greater purpose than what you anticipate. Or you know that the God of all the universe has a purpose for you. But here's what we do. We look at our garden and say, I just don't like it. You look at my neighbor's garden. The grass is so much greener. And you say, God, I don't like this garden. Just because you don't like it, it doesn't mean it's not the garden that you're supposed to be in. In fact, it says in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, it says, Many are the plans... In the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Do you know what that means? It means that the sooner you get along with the purpose of which God has planted for you, the garden for which God has created you, the better your life will be. But you have to get to that place. God has placed you where you are. Because He knows that in that place you will flourish. Now, if you are a believer today, my hope is that it encourages you to know that, listen, you have a garden to cultivate. If you're not a believer today, maybe you watch it online, my prayer is that today you give your life to Jesus because that's going to be the start of your garden today. 
or at least for a start of your understanding that, hey, I have a place to go cultivate and to see amazing things come out of. Number two, to remind yourself of. What I want is not always an indication of what I was created for or to do. Just because, listen, I hear people say this all the time. I hear people say this, I, I want to grow up and be a celebrity. I want to grow up and be a singer, an actor. I want to grow up to be a pastor. I want to grow up to be a doctor. I want to grow up. I want to do this. People who are older say, I have this dream of becoming this. I want to be a musician. I want to be a, I don't know, a singer. I want everything you can think of. People say, I want to be this. Listen, just because you want it, it doesn't mean you were made for it. Maybe God has made you for a greater purpose than you anticipate or understand, and you have to fall into that and see that, hey, what you want is not what is necessary. Now, side note, maybe you're in a place in your life that you're thinking you're discontent in your life. And you say, I don't like where God has placed me. It doesn't look like the paradise of Eden. Let me tell you something. If you're a te- I mean, start with, this is an example, okay? If you're a teacher today, by the way, we have quite a few teachers at LifePoint, okay? Educate people in the education system. I appreciate the teachers. If you're a teacher today, you are placed in the garden of cultivating the young people to grow for the purpose of God and knowing what their identity really is. If you're in law enforcement or if you're first responders, you are placed in the garden that you are to teach people what it looks like to have divine authority, to take care of the needs of people. If you are a plumber, if you are a chef, if you are a cook, if you are something else, everything you do, God has placed you strategically where you are for that purpose. That is your garden cultivated, and don't think I forgot about the retired people. (laughs) If you're retired, listen, if you're retired, your purpose is not to go on vacations and play golf all day. That is not your purpose. You had a garden to cultivate, and now your responsibility is to supervise other gardeners and teach them how to cultivate their gardens. You still have a purpose. Don't say, I don't like this purpose. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. That means that God has planted you where he has planted you for a purpose. Remind yourself, number three, where God has placed me in life comes with boundaries that are for my good. Now listen, people look at, the Bible critics look at verse 17, okay, and they say, hold on, if God didn't want Adam and Eve, okay, or Adam and Eve essentially to eat from the forbidden tree, why would he plant it there? That is a great question. Did you know that? Because if God has a purpose, this is a great question every one of us should ask. If God has a purpose for everybody's life, if God had a purpose for Adam and he planted two trees, the tree of life and the tree, the forbidden tree or the the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he did so that man would know that if he gets close to that, he will break his boundaries. And if he breaks boundaries, then he's stepping outside of what he's made for. And in your place that you are right now, you have those boundaries. Now, I don't know what they are for you, but you have to discover, hey, God, what is the garden you have put me in? What are my boundaries? You have to seek those so I don't break them so that I don't become a broken vessel. So I don't become something that is not good. Now, it says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. It says God is the potter. Did you guys get that? We are the clay. Now, do you know, every dish has boundaries. Let me give you some examples. A plastic, a cheap disposable plastic cup has, the boundary with, has a boundary with boiling water. You pour boiling water in a cheap disposable cup, plastic, it will melt. A plate cannot be used as a cup. It has boundaries. A, pot, a potting, a flower pot cannot be used as a coffee pot. Now, you understand that. But you know when a dish becomes unusable, useless, three things that cause a dish to become useless. One, when it sits in a place thinking, well, I don't have a purpose. That's a useless dish. Two, when it is used for something that it is not made for, that is what the enemy is good at to convince you that you are not good for what God made you for, but you are better to do what you want to do. Number three, when the dish breaks, and only the potter can restore and mend the dish. So you have to ask yourself, are you being used for what you're made for, or are you breaking those boundaries? And the last thing I want you to remember, this is simple, okay? God has made you for eternity. 
Remind yourself, God has made me for eternity. Now listen, did you notice that God planted a tree of life in the middle of the garden? Anybody notice that? Are you sure? Did you notice that God did not say don't eat from it? Do you wonder why that is? I think God hoped that we would actually eat from it. Because God made us for eternity. But instead, we will see next week that mankind chose to eat from the forbidden tree and sin entered into the world. But God made you for eternity, and you have to accept and understand that. I'm getting close. I promise you, okay? I know we're running out of time. You guys still with me? Can you give me a few more minutes? All right. Verse, um, verse 18. Verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it is what? It isn't. I'm sorry. What did you say? Then the Lord God said, it is. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So God brought all the animals before man, say, name him, and said, hey, maybe you'll find a suitable partner. Now here's the crazy thing. God is omniscient. That means he knows all things. He already knew that the animals are not going to be suitable for man. Why did he take man through the process? Because God wants mankind to know for himself that you can seek and search and not still find if you're looking in the wrong place. And this is the reality for you and I is that, listen, I told you this last week, and I don't want to talk about that again, but we seek, we seek uh, our, our passions become our animals, okay? We look for partners and love in things that are just not going to give us what we are looking for. Because we were made to be creatures like God who have social, who need social interactions. In fact, this is my last lesson. Okay, last thing I want you to write down. God created us as relational beings to pursue suitable relationships, you were created as beings who need relationships. What that means is that people say, you know what, I, I, I'm, you can get mad at me, it's okay. You may say, well, I am really an introvert. I don't care how introvert you are. You still need social interactions. It doesn't matter. You say, no, I just don't like people. It doesn't matter. You still need it. If you don't get it, you're going to find yourself mentally in a place that you won't like in a little while. You still need social interactions. Maybe some people are watching online and say, you know what? I just I don't like people. That's why I don't go to church. Unless you have a good reason, okay, you have health issues, then you can't be right here. Eventually, you're going to regret it. Eventually, you realize that you need suitable relationships. That's why God took mankind and said, hey, name all the animals, and there was no one fit for him. Because if you are created in the image of God, that means that there are only two things that can satisfy us emotionally god and other people that we spend time with that's why we need healthy suitable relationships now i know this is talking about marriage and at some point in the book of genesis we're going to get to that because we're going to see the corruption that enters into marriage but let me finish with this it says verse 21 so the lord god caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, for the first time in creation story, man is amazed. This, is, this at last is the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man had just gone through the list of the animals, named them, and he's like, oh, none of them looks cute to me. <laughs> and God makes woman. He says, wow, at last. Still to this day, men drool over women because of it. And the same thing, women drool over men. Still because of that, that is still a reality because God created us for suitable relationships. And I'm not talking about a sexual relationship. A healthy relationship is so much more than pleasure. God created us for that purpose, that we would pursue one another. Later on, 
In the scripture, you see a chaos take place because of sin. You see later on, you're introduced to polygamy in the Bible. And I want you to notice this, that when God created, he didn't create two women out of his rib, but one. Because God created a perfect relationship. But later on, man corrupted that over and over, not just with polygamy, but so many other sexual things that came along the way to a point that every aspect of relationships became corrupted. So now we look at our relationships. They're not suitable things. They're just of evil within us. But I want to remind you today, if God... Now listen, there's so much else we could cover. I don't have the time right now, okay? We'll get to them. But if God created us in his own image, based on Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, if you remember last week, it says God made man in his own image. In the likeness of God, we were created. If we were created in the image of God, and if you look at these verses, then we were created to be dependent on the power, the external power of God to be moved and carried, if that is the reality. If we were created to be diligent in zeal, to work the ground, or to be placed in the garden for which God has created us, so that we would cultivate it wherever you are working right now, whatever your garden is. And if we were created to be in those relationships that are healthy for us, suitable relationships, that could only mean one thing, that unless we are abiding with all these, we will never be in our purpose. We will never experience our purpose properly, and we will keep going from one thing to another, and we will never find our true purpose. But you were made to be dependent on God. You were made to be the dust that He forms into a vessel for which He will use. You were made to be the vessels in the hands of Jesus that He pours the living water in and He hands it over to whoever else through you. You were made to cultivate your gardens. In that garden is the tree of life. And you were made to be the people as you cultivate that others in your garden, the plants in your garden are nurtured and they grow into the likeness of their maker. You were made to be relational beings, not with animals, not with other things, not with plants or imaginary friends, but relational beings first with Jesus and then with each other. So that as you communicate and as you talk, you reveal the image for which you were made for. So let me read one, a couple more verses to finish. First John chapter 2, verse 16, this is Jesus speaking. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. Now listen to this. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You were made to be eternal beings. Don't negate that. And if you're not in God's eternity right now, or if you have walked away from God, today's a day to come back and say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to cultivate the garden, to work it to keep it. I am ready to be where you want me to be. So in a moment, I'm going to pray. Our prayer warriors are scheduled for the service. They're going to come forward. This is your chance to come to God and say, God, I want to give myself to you totally. Maybe you are already in that garden working it, or maybe you have given up on it. But today is your chance to come and say, God, I want to be in your purpose. And if the Holy Spirit leads you to bow your heads or to raise your hands or to kneel before the Lord, feel free to come kneel up here or at your seats. Lord Jesus, I kneel before you this morning with my church family. Lord, we, we come to you. We bow our heads. We give you glory because you created us with such, with such zeal and diligence in you that we would be not only like you, but we would represent you wherever we are. And every single one of us who you created, those of us who are listening to this, we were created for something greater than what we think. 
And somewhere along the line, we forget our purpose. Somewhere along the line, we break our boundaries. And just like Adam and Eve, and we will see later on, we choose to eat from the forbidden tree. And we corrupt our purpose, we corrupt our nature. But yet, Lord, you are gracious enough today to bring us here together and to say to us that you desire us, that we are your prized position, that we are the only beings created in your image for a purpose, to be the vessels for which you use. And Lord Jesus, I pray for every soul that today they would see that they may be dust, but they are dust that have been formed into a vessel to be magnificent in you to be used and be put and placed in the hands of the king, to be the vessel that waters the broken, to be the vessels that bring the water of life to those who need it, to be the vessels that bring the theology, the concept, the truth of God's existence and power. Lord, thank you for making us. And Lord, may you keep the enemy away from us, May you not allow us to become broken vessels because of what the enemy pushes us to do. May we know our boundaries and we live in you, Jesus, so that we would bear fruit. Lord, be glorified in us and send us out as those who your spirit, your power is moving out so that we could be used for your purpose. Jesus, we give you praise. In your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Please stand.